We had demos and um, we didn't have a record label, but we felt it looked likely that, you know, a few people wanted to sign the band. So, you know, it was, so it seemed a good idea to start recording. I guess we were blessed with some nice songs to start with. You know, Griff always came up with some good tunes and we took them as far as we could. I was sort of obsessed with albums like Sign of the Times by Prince, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Welcome to the Pleasure Dome and What's Going On, Marvin Gaye, stuff like that. Rec records that um, claimed to uh, uh, capture the, the time and the place and the world's problems. I came over with all my gear, including this uh, pretty modest Pro Tool system. And I think that was the first time the band had ever worked with it, you know. And so I had Keon, Dov, and Gato, and everybody in the band sort of leaning over my shoulder. Once they saw, you know, um, all of you know the things that you could do with Pro Tools and manipulate audio, they got the idea in their head, like, ah, oh, wait, this is a whole different way of making records. The technology we had was what we used as writing tools and what we'd always done since day one, really. Not only did I bring a Pro Tools rig with me, but I also brought my uh, my assistant, uh, Eric, too. I feel like they had a vision, but I had no idea what their vision was, because when they spoke to each other, it was all in Welsh. <laughs> so you, there'd be all this, you know, huddling up and speaking what sounded like gibberish to me, and then someone would turn around and say, yeah, make that louder. I don't think Dav changed. He, he just wore his dressing gown for the entire session. We just sort of um, went to live in Mono Valley and started recording. The first Mono Valley sessions, they started a small set of songs and would see those, mo like, not entirely to completion, but quite far on, on the way through before we'd go on to the next one. Uh, I remember the first one, the first night, it was uh, like, uh, Happiness is a Warm Pun. It was just like raw, raunchy, one riff rock, you know, and I, I, I was in house to just the kind of thing I love. Sitting there on my first day, like, oh, this is going to be great. And it certainly was great, but it didn't go that direction everywhere. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really quite know what I was in for. We went on tour in America to promote Mung. And then we fell out with the bus drivers who were a, a couple, a married couple from Tennessee. 
they were in full agreement with the lifestyle of the super animals. We got to the village of Bearsville, they saw the sign and they just sort of dropped us off at the side of the road. They just sort of dumped us. Um, they drove away with one of Bumpf's shoes. Loads of our stuff was still on the bus and we were just sort of on the side of the road by a forest. We didn't know exactly where we were. Uh, you know, like six o'clock in the morning. That was the beginning of this, the second session. Bearsville is a, a studio um, in a town called Bearsville, and it, which is right next door to Woodstock. And uh, true to the name, there, there was a, a bear. There was a baby bear wandering about. This uh, little bear would come to look for beagles in the skip, um, and would dig around. And it was really cute. But they were warning us the mother might be from the corner somewhere. So, and after recording every night, we had to walk back to the house. The studio was like a, an old wooden barn, and then we stayed in these houses in the forest, and um, we were really worried about being attacked by bears, so we just recorded a lot. The band wanted to do uh, surround mixes and video and film for each song on Gorilla, you know, and the label just you know said no, and then they they forwarded the idea to uh, Epic, and we were about like what. On like three weeks into tracking, when we finally got the, the approval for you know doing the surround mixes, and then all of a sudden our work became magnified by a factor of five. You know, everything became five part harmonies, then one song just five drum sets, and you know, it was just crazy. Yeah, we, I think we, um, given all these toys to play with, we wanted to see what they could do. I actually remember the brief that uh, Keon gave me for um, alternate route to Vulcan Street. He was like, I want I want this, the audience to feel like they're sitting in the middle of a carousel and the band is rotating around them, you know? And that was, that was the idea from like day one. And then I had to spend the next two and a half months in my head trying to, you know, mechanically figure out how to do it. We had this surround room and with the massive, you know, speakers and subwoofers. We wanted to test it out. And I don't know, remember whose idea it was. They put on the launch scene from Apollo 13. We just put it on, on the highest volume, you know, as, as a reference for the, for the engineer, really. And the room was shaking. We were all just shaking with sound. And at, by the end of it, I think Keon and Bump were standing going, USA! <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it, it kind of drove home to me, like, finally, this is a van. This is a bunch of guys that just want to move the earth. They just want to make the room shake. As far as I knew, nobody had ever released a, a brand new studio record in the surround as a simultaneous release uh, with, the, with the CD player, with the CD as well. We were big gamers at the time. We'd play a lot of games on tour and in the studio. Um, but the PlayStation 2 was set up for 5-1. So it was, we saw that as, oh, there's no going back from this. This is, you know, this is the way people are going to experience music and, and games. I remember very embarrassingly saying in a garden interview, oh, I'm never going to mix in stereo ever again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, and then uh, about a month later, Napster happened, and MP3s and downloads, and that was the end of surround sound. I had made the horrible mistake, I think, at one point, telling the band, it's like, well, there really isn't much you can't do in Pro Tools, and that was really a big mistake. <laughs> Griff possibly had parts one and two. Yeah. yeah um, and then Dav came up with part three. The fourth part came out from a jam. And then it went into a rap section um, where we thought we'd crossed some kind of... I mean, we were crossing a lot of lines every day, but, we, but there was some kind of line that we all agreed was too far out. has these different sections to it where the music changes from quite sort of bucolic to sort of like really kind of violent, almost black metal vocals. So I kind of saw it as 
wanted to do something uh, that reflected that. So have these almost like chapters of this animation be quite different and, and react to the mood of the song. And the idea of kind of almost, almost like a sort of video game came to mind, like a scrolling platform game. So you're completing one level and entering another one. Trippy thing to happen to anybody, you know, involved in music is to, to get a, a tape from Paul McCartney and his, you know, chewing celery. These awards ceremonies, would, they would always start them at like 11 a.m. and give you loads of booze because that made for good TV. And then Kian, you know, went off to the toilet, come back with Paul McCartney. He says, boys, boys, this is Paul. And Kian basically accosted Paul McCartney in the toilet. We sent him a stereo back in track so he could keep time. Then he sent... But that back with a message at the start with a really dodgy Welsh accent. <laughs> Didn't sound anything else. And then and then he goes, I hope you like it. And then next thing you know, you're just seeing like like this chewing. He was really cool in letting us do that and trusting us. He doesn't have to be nice, Paul McCartney, you know, but I think he's a genuine, genuine dude. My favorite contribution to the record vocally was working out the, the background vocals for uh, Run Christian Run. I got bumped to sing this in incredibly weird harmony that like, sits right in the middle and kind of has like this sort of Neil Young quality to it. And like the whole thing comes across like this big Crosby Stills and Nash thing, which I didn't tell the band I was doing at the time because I knew I would have been voted out. Backgrounds, we definitely spent quite a bit of time uh, on, on the record, um, just getting absolutely perfect, you know, because I just thought that the songs are just so un unbelievably strong, you know, um, that I didn't want, like, I didn't want any, any flaws whatsoever. Griff has got such an amazingly rich voice, and he has like these quirks in his voice, <laughs> pitch-wise, I, I, I absolutely adore. And so I, I, I made sure to preserve that, but if I was going to preserve that, I wanted to make sure that the background vocals were just super solid and super in tune so that there's room for Griff to actually float around. One of the important songs for the band was um, Silver Machine by Hot Quinn. So it, it, it's sort of... Um, I, I, I don't know, we wanted to combine that with something else. It's got references to Japanese, a Japanese um, drink called post water that we used to drink on tour in Japan, which was um, like water, but superior somehow. It's called post water. It was definitely seen a lot of influence, I guess, from from games and the way the menus worked on the, on those things, um, and and the options of going down little wormholes and finding secret little snippets of music. There's a whole culture of sort of just people doing bongs and playing PlayStation and listening to music through games and. A lot of people we sort of knew were like that. And in a way, we thought we'd make an album for the, for them, you know, or, or for, for ourselves, in a way. We did a lot of stuff that I think people probably, it probably just passed them by. You know, I think we spent a lot of time on, on the DVD menu. You know, who gives a shit about a DVD menu? But at the time, we were thinking, wow, these menus are really um, underused. And we created a whole load of music in surround sound for, for the menu. If someone got an idea in, their, idea in their head, let's do it, let's try it. Let's not argue about it. Let's not talk behind each other's backs about it. It's, let's just do it. And uh, uh, it's the only record I ever worked on that had that kind of spirit to it. I think Paul put recording an album downstairs with um, Scott Walker producing. So every day we'd walk past Scott Walker eating a burger in the in the bar on the way to the I was due to.
And um, so that was a good, just a sort of good home then, every, every, every day to, to sort of stare at Scott Walker for a bit, eating his burger. For a quite a long time, the, the record could have been a double album. I think, honestly, my whole job as a producer on this record was to tell everybody to stop, you know, at a certain point, because too many ingredients is going to uh, spoil the meal, you know? In, in the States, it, it came in a double set. They put the B-sides in with it as well on the CD, so that it became a sort of double record in, the, in America. And uh, the sensible one record everywhere else. I think Griff wanted Brian Harvey to sing uh, Juxtapose With You. Our motto for the record was more is more. It couldn't have come at a time that was more sort of stripped back to basics rock and roll. Um, this other stuff that I was working at that time was the White Stripes and, you know, a lot of sort of garage rock bands were really blowing up. The Strokes were obviously huge. Everyone was writing all these stories. The return of rock and back to basics. And then there was the Super Furry Animals crammed all of them onto some stage with like a million different speakers and s screens and projections. It was the complete and total opposite of what everyone had been raving about. I think it worked in their favor, you know? There was a complication at, at I think it was the start of, of the Rings Around the World tour. The band all, and crew all flew over and I met them at the airport. Their manager uh, did warn me that Griff probably won't be on the flight because he couldn't find his passport. We wanted to present the records in surround sound. So we, we did the live show in surround and we presented it in cinema in surround sound as well. The idea was to do like a bingo acoustic shows in the afternoon and then do a gig at night. Uh, we had a club night as well afterwards because we just, that's what we enjoyed doing was playing records. In Japan, Bump got hurt pretty badly. We found him in a darkened ditch um, backstage. I laugh now because it's a funny story, but he screwed up his ankle pretty badly. I mean, it was swollen um, like three times the size. We only noticed it when we got on the shuttle bus that was taking us to the airport. We we're going to fly overnight from Osaka to Tokyo. And the guitar tech, Nobby, was like, you can't go on a plane bump. Your, your, your ankle's going to explode. And then it was really exciting. Touring America. It was very clear that a lot of the American media had never come into contact with a Welsh person before. Someone asked it, so what does your name mean? And he said, um, he who slays wolves. Well, that fragile happiness. We had a party at Metropolis, like at, while we were mixing. We just finished, we were listening back to the stereo mixes. I, I think I actually got all kind of teary eyed halfway through that. We took a weekend off in New York City and um, we patted on a rooftop somewhere and under the sort of Twin Towers and there's fireworks going off. And then the album came out in Europe in the, in the, the next summer. And then 9-11 happened. And um, when we came back to America, we released the record a few months after yeah, the, the climate, it was a really different climate. The first generation. This record really was an overwhelming experience for me. I mean, it's, it's probably, if somebody had to, if I had to, if every record I've done in the last 30 plus years, this is probably up there in the top three, you know, um, if not the top two. Emotionally for me, it was, it was, really overwhelming you know I, I think i did some of my best work you know on that record it's the only record i think sticks that i ever worked on and i, I told chris a while back i told I, I can't remember what we were talking about but i said when when it's all over and i'm meeting my maker i show him a picture of my daughter i'm gonna play him with him. and that's it Ha <laughs> ha
So this is like the main character kind of waking up from a nap in a we sort of I worked with my friend Simon Pike, a really good friend of mine. I went to art school with him. He, he sort of he animated this but also kind of worked, pulled in the sort of art deco look of the interiors on it, which is something we really, really got into. Um, and <laughs> it, it's a, I think I mentioned about it being um to have been influenced by platform games, kind of wanted wanted that sort of feel of it. Everything sort of quite cutesy, eyes on it, like sort of things could be interactive. So hear me. It's to this. Um, here we go. It's going about its day. Don't really know what's uh, what's going on generally. In fact, <laughs> working on, working on this, we did we had a kind of rough storyboard. But I think we did a lot of. I was obviously working ahead of Simon making all the assets for him to animate. But um, kind of, yeah, quite a lot of it. it, it obviously, the song has lots of different um, changes to it, different sections. So we kind of chopped up, or we we, we marked up these different parts of the animation that um, could change and evolve as the song changes and evolves. Um, so yeah, so this is we, we're getting a, the sort of first chapter here. We've just been randomly sprayed by this guy, this creature that's just come out of the um, the desert ground, um, which we'll, we'll learn of that significance perhaps later. Uh, but again, like the, the sort of uh, the sort of video game um, influence here, things bouncing around, and and again, like what are things that sort of really sort of this sort of fake 3D, but everything's just sort of 2D, um, kind of like the old school platform games. So this is, um, you, when you're watching this, um, when this is published to the internet, um, you'll be able to hear the music at the top, which I can't right now, just point that out. So I can't just, I'm always trying to like scrub through the song in my head, going like, where, where are we now? So this is one of the big sort of changes again in, in, in the song. I think this is the, where it's, uh, Quite sort of you kill it. Oh, there's the worms uh, crossing his path. That, I don't think that's a good omen. I think. I mean, I'm, spoiler: I've seen this before, obviously. Um, but <laughs> so yeah, we're through this kind of strange forest now, coming to. Um, uh, oh, and he's changed. So it's kind of changing as we go through this um, this whole journey. It's a nice bit of. Fake to fake 3D. That kind of flash was brilliant for this stuff. All right, it's kind of amazing what um, Simon's able to do with it. Um, but yeah, so we're getting towards the sort of final level of the game now. Again, a little bit of Art Deco sort of reference. So this is the the section of the video where the the cover kind of comes from, with the sort of final skulls emerging. Um, I think right now the song it's getting it's pretty heavy. I think Griff's doing his uh, best black metal vocal um, performance here. Um, and I think it, another reference to this, we were like looking at as well as video games and I guess like comics and just kind of really sort of overly cutesy things um, was the, the sequence, sort of the pre-black hole or the famous sequence from 2001 where things flashing past him, but just wanted to make it like really cute sort of slash sinister sort of like a nice balance of this this crazy smiling creature that's just slowly evolving into um into the skull that we see on the cover i haven't seen that for quite a while so that was yeah that was a very sort of jazz improv voiceover i think i did that as they sit down to discuss guns around the world. The 
Crowley So and welcome to the Welsh Music Podcast. I'm James Cuff and as ever I'm joined by Neil Collins and Dave Owens. Hello. Uh, special episode tonight boys, we're talking through the uh, 20th anniversary of uh, Super Furry Animals, um, yeah, most ambitious album to date um, with rings around the world. Um, these, these, these anniversaries, these birthdays keep popping up, they keep, they're thick and fast, it's making me feel really old. I don't know about you guys but... Um, I remember when um, when this album came out and, you know, I didn't have much money. I think I was still a student um, and had to choose really between the CD, um, which I was collecting since, you know, the early days, um, or the DVD, this, you know, this new sort of groundbreaking sort of, uh, you know, distribution of, of an album. And I went for the DVD um, and I'm glad I did because, yeah, those the, the videos on there are amazing and you know, a lot of effort went into the production. What can you guys remember about the uh, the launch of the album? Well, it, it's spooky you mention that, Cuffy, because uh, I got a DVD as well. And I think I'd sort of bought into the whole concept of the album, you know, that was being mm. touted as this sort of uh, pioneering surround sound technology, put it on your DVD player, have an immersive experience at home. And um, it's actually really poignant to me, this, this album, because... Uh, I remember exactly where I was and what was happening at the time I, I bought it. Um, I just got back to Cardiff after 10 years in London and uh, was was working at Media Wales, uh, Wales on Sunday newspaper. And we were, we were trying to get my wife back to get a job down here. And she'd gone for an interview and I had a walk in uh, just around the corner. The nearest record shop was HMV. Uh, went in there and got a DVD and several other things. And... Um, yeah, she came back to the car, it all gone brilliantly, and she got the job, and we've been here ever since. So, oh, amazing. Yeah, it was, yeah, like a really momentous sort of moment that uh, I'll always remember about, about buying this album, essentially, on DVD, yeah. Amazing. Neil, what about you? Have you got anything as... Uh, as yeah, uh... I, I, I was 15 years old when um, a Super, uh, Rings Around the World came out. Um, I started going to gigs about a year later, uh, so that was when my real obsession kicked in. But yeah, I bought the... I went to the DVD as well. Oh, go hat I, I don't know, as, Dave, <laughs> <laughs> as Dave just said, like, you know... It, it, it was such an incredible sort of difference as well. I mean, DVDs you weren't, weren't sort of ubiquitous at the round around then sort of thing. So it was still really special. And I'd hear about these surround sound mixes and every, you know, track of a video. And I uh, bought it from, um, can you remember that random, um, well, it was a chain actually. It was MVC on the Haze. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you had a card, oh, yeah. you had yeah, a card, you'd have some random amount off, like yeah, 40 yeah, yeah. pence or something like that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's where I got yeah, mine, yeah. yeah. But, okay. um it's, it's, it's still really special for me for that for that reason as well. You know, I know they did it with Phantom Power as well, didn't they? They had the DVD yeah. out. And that was when I first got into the theories. That was when I first saw the Phantom Power tour. But, um, yeah, it's absolutely special me for that reason. It's just a unique sort of um, – it's a real gem in your collection. I wouldn't get rid of this. But right. I, have, uh, I have peeled off the MDC sticker uh, recently. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, well, yeah. that's, that's understandable. <laughs> but what, what I remember about then taking it home was um, – Made a point of putting a DVD, you know, get uh, turn the DVD player on, putting it in, and having this real sense of anticipation of what I was about to see, and just remembering turning a sort of the big light off, almost having a cinematic ambiance, if you like, and then you know entering this super furry animal, Pete Fowler animated generated sort of world, and it all sort of made sense and came together you know because it's a concept album isn't it you know it's it's, yeah. it's the furries sergeant pepper it, it's it's their pet sounds you know it's their most ambitious album and um yeah that's a round sound idea just typified what they were going for um on their new label obviously they were on a major I, I th- for a yeah i think as well that there's no album that sounds like it with headphones on it's just incredible like um the one to listen to of all the tracks as well, I think, is a touch sensitive. It's, it's just Kian, Kian's um, technical sort of wizardry on it is incredible. There's a real tension to that track. So if you really blast it up, it, it, it does get you sort of, you know, in the hairs on the back of your arms up. Mm. And, um, mm. yeah, I, I think, as, as Dave was uh, saying, um, 
you know, I think um, the theories were always a little bit too eccentric to be completely mainstream, which is a position they're probably comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. But this is the realisation of what the super theories could do with mainstream money. You know, they were supported by the ample coffers of Sony and, you know, more specifically um, Epic. Rob Stringer was a huge uh, supporter of them. And it's absolutely incredible. Um, I think it's uh, by far the most ambitious album. It's their most eclectic. Um, I can't decide whether it's my favourite. I'm like most fans, you know. <laughs> I can't give a definitive answer in that respect. But yeah, it's, it's definitely in the top three. Yeah, I'm sure, mate, yeah, like I'm, most fans, it changes it on a you know week-to-week basis. Um, and yeah, something you mentioned there, Neil, was something I wanted to chat about was um, obviously, you know, it's a, it's a well-trodden path that, you know, they've had, you know, su- substantial sort of financial backing they could, you know, play with all of the tools in the studio, you know, coming off Mung, it was stripped back, really lo-fi. It's mm-hmm. such a polarizing, you know, uh, sort of duos in, in, in their in their discography. But, um, you know, Kian, I think it definitely, you know, been able to, you know, yeah, his technical wizardry, it just, just comes to the front in this album, doesn't it? I think it's, it's also, you know, you remember when it came out, it was sort of, it, it was the end of the Britpop party, it was the end of Creation Records. Um, you know, Mung was sort of a almost like a sober reflection. You know, paired paired down, stripped back, uh, pastoral sounding album. And then, you know, everybody was sort of unsure, weren't they, about what the new millennium and what that was going to bring, and you know, the millennium bug and all these yeah. sort of stories about what was about to, to happen. So I think in a way, you know, harnessing technology as we entered a new millennium sort of was just the right thing to do. You know, it was almost a celebration, I think, of the, and a sign of the times, um, mm. <laughs> which is ironically I think one of in, the albums in... to, to yeah, influence this, you know? Yeah, true, true, true. Um, I think as well, though, it, it is sort of, when you look back in and that time, you know, 2001, you know, everyone... You know, we listened to the White Stripes, the Strokes. You know, it was all, that was all stripped yeah. back. You know, so it's almost like Super Fury Animals play into their strengths in terms of the you know the the outsider by going completely opposite to what everyone else was going, and you know being really heavily lavishly produced and yeah, spending the money yeah. when everyone else was stripping back. Um, yeah, think look, yeah, like looking yeah. back at two thousand and one now with uh, yeah with hindsight. But um, I guess the other thing that was um, you know I guess interesting about this one is. Is that um, you know a lot of talking about the um, the production of value, but I think you know Dave, you touched on it as well. It's a very eclectic album, and you know you set you settle down to watch his DVD. It's very cinematic in its sort of appeal, and and for me, it feels like it's it's more of a soundtrack, a film soundtrack than than a, than an album. You know, you go from you know the yeah. you know I think um, you know the receptacle for the respectable you know music video that the Pete Fowler did, and you know the different parts yeah, yeah. in there. You know, there's the country yeah. tunes in, in Run, Christian, Run. You know, there's like interludes that become songs, you know, classic sort of super furries, you know, um, motifs and signatures. But, you know, in this album, I just think it just it just feels like a cinema, um, sorry, a movie soundtrack. I think it's a sign of a band sort of being comfortable in themselves as well. And almost, you know, uh, apologies for the cliche, getting there big money transfer to <laughs> one of the top three, you know, that they've been showing off their skills maybe in the uh, the, the championship and the lower Premier League, but this was an opportunity now to, you know, um, show off their their skills, their myriad talents on a, on a mm. bigger stage. And, um, you know, the eclectic nature of the album certainly underlined what they could bring to the party that, you know, it seems like a soundtrack. And when you find out the story behind the making of the album, um, you know, deep in the woods in America, yeah. um, I'd love to see the cine camera footage almost <laughs> soundtrack by by this, you know, running scared of bears in the woods and <laughs> um, being kicked off their, their, their bus by uh, what sounds like two evangelical Christian, <laughs> a, a couple who were the drivers. Who couldn't, have, you know, wouldn't have any truck with the super furry lifestyle, and it's just, you know, that is them, isn't it? It's, it's mm. this sort of, um, uh, you know, iridescent animated 
story. You know, they're they're a cartoon characters in rock and roll form. I think, and that's what, I, what I, we I do think love you about. Just can't, you can't escape the fact that I mean, I I, I always think that. The Super Furries are still underrated, no matter how yeah. um, critically acclaimed they are. They're still underrated, and you know um, they've got five geniuses in the band. And I know genius is a, is a, a word that's bandied around a lot, but th- there's five individuals there that really bring diverse ideas and just different styles, and it's just absolutely exemplified on this album. Um, as you were yeah. saying about the di- di- diversity in styles, what are the bands? could go from that sort of softly sung bit with Daff in Receptacle and then go into this, like, thrash metal sort of wig out. That, yeah. But it still makes sense and it's yeah. still, it doesn't jar, you know. It, it's, it, I, I, I think it's the album that they really come in. Not, I wouldn't even say coming to their own, that sounds a bit, um, that's not the right word. I, what I'm saying is their absolute charisma and qualities all really came to the floor on this album. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And Dave, you mentioned Beach Boys at the start as well, and you know the the, the yeah. harmonies on this album, and you know, perfect pop sort of precision with juxtaposed with you as well. You know, one of one of the three singles off the album. Um, you know, yeah. I, I, I think at this point they couldn't put a foot wrong. But also, like you know, is it you know, it's a commercial album. They're you know they're on a big label, but they were nominated for Mercury as well. They obviously didn't win, but um, you know that's kind mm. of you know, shows that the, the level and the dexterity of the songwriting on this album as well is um is super impressive. And let's not forget um the little matter of uh, um, <laughs> a, a certain beat a certain yeah. beat Paul McCartney <laughs> chewing celery on uh, receptacle for the respectable. Um, and again, it's just you know, for a journalist, this this band are. Are mm. quote gold, Absolutely. you know. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Their whole story is is fantastic. And then, uh, so they were at an award ceremony, weren't they? I think it could be yeah. the Enemy Award. I mean, Mac no, was getting, it, um, yeah, was I think it was. Yeah, it was, it was the Liverpool Sun Collage. Yeah, the, the album that they collaborated on eventually. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what was it? Kian bumped into Maka in the toilets and then dragged him back to the furry table. <laughs> and he came, table and he came back and said, said, "This is put. This is Paul. Yeah, yeah this, this is not made Paul." Paul. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just asked him if he could. I think he said, "Can can we remaster all the Beatles albums for you or something?" But <laughs> obviously, that was finally uh, watered down to a degree, and asked him to to munch celery on the album. But <laughs> you know, that just uh, typifies it for me. But I think I, I think. Go on, Go on Dave. Yeah, all I, I was. I, gonna... I think as well that they've never <laughs> sort of compromised. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, I think they just never compromised that sort of eccentricity as well, you know. Yeah. Like when they couldn't get Bobby Brown or um, Brian Harvey, Griff just thought, like, I'll, I'll, I'll do that myself. You know, I'll use a yeah. vo- vocal for the Coda, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, incredible, like, yeah. Imagine Brian well. Harvey chewing on juxtaposed with you. That would have been... Uh... <laughs> I mean, not he could have been he could have been chewing um, potatoes, wouldn't there? Jack of potatoes, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess Dave, you say you know they're perfect for um you know journalists, and I think when we spoke to um you know uh, Haver about you know some of the stories um because he, he he sort of chose Rings Around the World as his favorite album as well, and there's definitely like a mythology in in a lot of the Super Furry Animals tales, and there's a sort of like thin line between truth and maybe untruth and you don't really know what's going on but what um, i'm really yeah. looking forward to hearing it in this reissue is they've got the um they've got the um the raw file of of mccartney chewing the celery which i've never heard <laughs> oh, before amazing. so i'm looking forward to yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, hearing that which yeah. sounds a bit weird yeah. like you know for the and asmr actually, they generation they gave him a percussion track didn't they Pardon? So he actually had a perc- uh, yeah, a yeah, percussion yeah, yeah. track supplied time. by the yeah. band as well yeah 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 absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they, um, they seem to just take it all in their stride, didn't they? You know, and yeah. obviously with the money they had at their disposal from um, uh, Epic Records, wasn't it? Yeah, um, they they were obviously Sony. Anyway, Epic, subsidiary yeah, Epic, Sony. Su- yeah, subsidiary yeah, yeah. Sony, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, if you can throw everything and the kitchen sink at it, why wouldn't you? You know. Yeah. And all power to them for, like you said, Cuffy, you know, the music scene was just a, a wash with 
what do they call it? A new rock riot or something yeah, with uh, yeah. strokes and the vines and, mm. you know, bands like that around at the time. And again, he just went completely against convention. Well, well, but I, I think it was they... ju- just to say, Neil, that, you know, it was their biggest charting album, wasn't it? At number three. Yeah. yeah. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So to some degree, it did eke itself into the mainstream. Um, what was it? Were they beaten by Destiny's Child and David Destiny's Gray? Destiny's Child, yeah. It was number <laughs> yeah, one David in midweek, Gray. I think. <laughs> so, you know, um, Super Furry Animals from Wales and uh, David Gray from Solver, I think, isn't he? So, yes, that's right. a Welsh yeah. connection. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think he is. I, I can't yeah, I put just, down just Destiny's that. Child's Welsh credentials, but <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I'm Sorry, sure there's but, something yeah. somewhere. There, you know, there's always uh, the... Uh, yeah, I, I was just thinking that... Um, <laughs> They, they had produced these three sort of perfect sort of madcap pop rock um, albums with uh, Fuzzy Logic, Radiator and Gorilla. And yeah. all of a sudden they were left without creation, which could have, you know, really sort of disturbed some bands' fluency yeah. and sort of confidence. They yeah. came back with a masterpiece from Mung, c- completely on their own terms, on Plastic Casual, their own label. Suddenly they got Sony. And it must have been the band were pinching themselves because I know Griff has been quoted as saying... We could be, you know, drop within a year here. Let's just absolutely throw everything at this. And yeah, yeah. And, and as as you, as you were saying, Dave, it's I I think it's really come to fruition, you know, fruition on this album. I also think they, you know, like we all three of us have said that, you know, they're overlooked in a way that um, they don't get the, the dues they deserve. I mean, they do in, in Wales, of course, yeah. but you know, I almost see them a bit like. Um, I don't know, like the Flaming Lips, maybe in America. Yeah, you yeah. know, who've got the same spirit of invention and playfulness and creativity and a, and an avant-garde sort of streak uh, underlining everything. And you know, I think they're going to be one of those bands that are going to last the um, the test of time. And you know, like psych rock albums on vertigo from the 70s are, are worth a shed load of money I, I got a feeling mm. that this era of super furry animals and everything will be looked back with the same kind of creative wonder as as those sorts of you know pioneering psych prog band of yesteryear were you know because they're in that same kind of lineage for me um yeah yeah absolutely and I guess that, you know, you mentioned, you know, Flaming Lips, um, you know, they're, they're such an unassuming characters as well, aren't they? You know, you see them, you know, on the streets of Cardiff quite frequently. And Dave, remember we did the, um, um, we were filming the, 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 was it Dark Days, Light Years? Um, yeah, the, very, the best like, the very Best of Neil Diamond. Very Best of Neil Diamond, yeah. And, you know, we were, we were, we were, we were working with them on that and, we walked out of Media Wales, pop around the corner, and then you know Gitter was on the bench having a rolly, and you know no, every the world, the world and his you know dog was passing by, not knowing that you know one of the most you know prodigious talents in Welsh music history, and one in one of the greatest bands ever. I'm going to throw that out there tonight. You know um, yeah, they are. Yeah. You know was just sat there. You know just chilling, having a rolly as they're getting prepared for you know uh, a, a, a sort of. Um, you know, a, a back to the root sort of uh, gig in in a very small venue in the centre of Cardiff. Yeah. But yeah, no, they're um, yeah. they're great bands. Um, I, I just listened to Greg Haver's episode of the of the podcast. Um, just in preparation for this tonight, and um, I think I said the Presidential Suite was my favourite song on this album, and I think it's got to be Presidential Suite and Run Christian Run. The, that duo, that yeah. Yeah. you know, that those two songs are just just amazing for me. You know. They, go on a little bit you know longer than most sort of you know two three minute pop songs but yeah there's just the yeah just the quality in there what's your what's your highlights guys uh mine would be run christian run um and especially just because of the sort of way that it it sways and builds and and it's a sort of crescendo and um live it sort of takes on uh a completely different form, I think. And it just, I know it's a, it's going to be a Welsh football cliche here for a second, but <laughs> it just takes me back to that gig in Toulouse. Toulouse, uh, yeah. Before, yeah. you know, yeah. before the, uh, the, the, the Russia game. 
that sort of Welsh uh, football music festival, as it turned out to be, with the furries headlining. Uh, Run, Christian, Run was just one of the highlights to me. I just felt in the element, in the zone, you know, you get that sometimes at gigs, don't you, when everything just comes together. Um, and I know for them, technically, it wasn't the, the, the greatest gig, but in its rawest sense, it was just pure emotion for all the all the fans that were, were watching it. So, yeah, I love that. Yeah. And, and Rings Around the World is just a sing-along anthem as well, you know. But, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Neil, what about you? Yeah, I... I, I... I mean, I, I think that I, I, whether it was the band's choice or whether it was Epic's, I, I think they got the single choices spot on, you know, with Juxtapose, Rings Around the World, and It's Not the End of the World. I thought they were commercially uh, just the right decisions to make, but just the, just the track sequencing is so good, you know, like you've got this gentle like piano-led song, uh, Alternative Route to Vulcan Street. Then you've just got like this sort of Beach Boys-esque, you know, site work surfer girl. But yeah, I think they really came into their own in this album lyrically as well. There's some dark sort of themes like explored, you know, um, you know, uh, no sympathy is one, and it's followed up uh, obviously by Run Christian Run. So it's the sort of evangelical sort of death cult um, people like Jim Jones spring to mind. Whereas, um, yeah, I, I think previously they had been these sort of fun loving guys, which they still were, obviously, but. Um, you know, where, where it would be Frankie Fontaine now? It's bringing to mind sort of, you know, um, on Presidential Suite, the Monica uh, Lewinsky and yeah. President Clinton affair. And yeah, cool. Yeah, they, they, I, I think, um, you know, it's still a, uh, a few months removed from 9 11, but there's definitely a tension sort of beating at the heart of the album underneath the sort of breezy sort of melodies at points and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I don't know what you guys think. Well, yeah, that, no, that's definitely. a good point you make, actually, isn't it, about 9 11? Did it? Um, it was sort of. I, I, I know a lot of bands who put out albums at the time, or were about to tour, or whatever. Just said that you know that event cast such a huge shadow yep. over everything. And like the furry said, when they went back to America to promote the album, that everything had changed. You know, everything was different. Yep. And um, you know, it's it's an album from the times and of the times, you know. Um, but, 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 yeah, and I think, I, strange I think time well, for everybody. They explored, they explored it more on Phantom Power then, isn't it, with tracks like Liberty Bell um, and obviously with the, the illusion of the title, like, you know, who, who's actually controlling things, who's in power yeah, and that sort of thing. Yeah. But, um, yeah, incredibly interesting band, you know, and, yeah, amazing album. I think 20 years, God, God, I feel... Oh, my God. Yeah, I know, mate, feel old, definitely feel old, I'm old. Um, and yeah, I think this is the first time we're being seen on video, so people can see how old we actually are, not just a face for radio <laughs> on a podcast. Um, I think I mentioned this in the Greg Haver episode, but it's the first time there's a song on the album that the album, or the album's title is the song on an album, which they've never done before. Oh, okay. Yeah, a little fun fact. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, we- love that, love that. We, can, we could talk about this album all day, boys, but, you know, running out of time... So I'm um, going to yeah, call proceedings to a halt at this point and just want to say uh, thank you to, uh, to Rick for you know, making us you know, part of this, uh, this event, special event this evening. Um, you know, we've, yeah, we're on at Welsh Music Pod on you know, a lot of the socials, follow us, you know, subscribe to us on, on the podcast. A lot of great Super Furry Animals content there. We've got you know, Sue Charles talking about Fuzzy Logic. There's um, Greg Haver, as we mentioned, talking about rings around the world. We did a special episode on the 20th anniversary of Mung uh, featuring you know the good and I'll say the bad and the ugly but there isn't bad and ugly on there um you know <laughs> uh, you know people involved in 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 Welsh music uh history and and, and you know the band themselves We've got Mark Roberts from Catatonia talking about Phantom yeah. Power um and obviously this tonight um so uh, yeah, please uh, subscribe. And we, and we've got uh, we got Rick Rawlings' episode to arrange for Gorilla as well. Oh yeah, true. Yeah, that's on the uh, the, the 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 long long list of uh, things we need to get <laughs> on with with this podcast. Um, cool. So yeah, thanks, boys, and uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Um, yeah, Nostar. Thank you.